Excellent. So tomorrow we're going to be in a different room at Cantor. There should be a map somewhere where uh, you'll be able to find the location of that building. Okay. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be in a different room at Cantor, uh, and there should be a map somewhere in your package that tells you where it is. Um, and at 12 o'clock, uh, a bunch of AI safety uh, speakers are, uh, they want to host a networking lunch uh, uh, and to talk about careers in AI safety. So this, is, this will be an opportunity for attendees if you want to meet some of these uh, leading researchers to sort of meet them and talk to them. So uh, if you are interested in do that, doing that, it's, it's going to be at around 12 o'clock. Just hang around the auditorium in the canter, the, the room we'll be in, and they'll come and find you. Or uh, I think Jan here is, uh, look for him. Um, and um, uh, so th that's tomorrow. Okay, so right now, now we're in this session on building morality into machines. Uh, the first uh, speaker we have is uh, Stephen Wolfram. He's one of my personal heroes because he's the creator of Mathematica. It's one of those really groundbreaking uh, uh, software uh, back in 1988. Um, he's also the founder and CEO of Wolfram Research, Wolfram Alpha, and the Wolfram Language. And he's the author of A New Kind of Science, an Elementary Introduction to the Wolfram Language, and ideas ma uh, Idea Makers. And I think he's also the youngest um, to have won the MacArthur Fellowship, if I got that correctly. And today he's going to talk about how to tell AIs what to do and what to tell them. Please uh, join me welcome. Okay. Well, thanks for inviting me here today. It's, it's actually quite funny to be here because my mother was a philosophy professor in Oxford way back when. And when I was a kid, I always used to say the one thing I would never do was be a philosopher or talk about philosophy. So here I am. Um, but uh, before I really get into talking about AI, I thought I should say a little bit about my kind of personal worldview. I mean, I basically spent my life sort of alternating between doing basic science and uh, building technology. And I've been interested in AI for about as long as I can remember. As a kid, though, I started out doing physics and cosmology and things like that. That got me into building technology to automate stuff like math. That worked out so well that I started thinking about, OK, like, uh, how, how would one really compute everything about everything? And that, that was in about 1980. And at first, I thought I sort of had to build something like a brain to be able to do that. And I started studying neural nets and so on, but I didn't, didn't get very far. Meanwhile, I kind of got interested in an even bigger problem in science, sort of how to make the most general possible theories of anything. Um, and the dominant idea for about 300 years had been to use math and equations and things to make theories in science, but I sort of wanted to go beyond that. And the big thing I realized was that the way to do that was to think about programs and the kind of sort of whole computational universe of, of possible programs. And if I can see if this wakes up. Wake up, computer. Okay. Let's see. Oh, there we go. There's one. Okay, so it's sort of a, a, a computational universe of uh, an array of very simple programs. These are cellular automata. And um, studying these things led to sort of my personal kind of Galileo-like moment, which is, you know, just point the computational telescope at these very simplest possible programs, and then turns out you see some amazing things. Like, for example, my favorite is this one called Rule 30 that just seems to, it, it's based on that um, very simple rule down at the bottom there. And it just keeps on going and just seems to keep on producing uh, complexity forever from essentially nothing. So after I'd seen this, I kind of realized that um, it's actually something, this phenomenon of sort of being able to produce lots of complexity from almost nothing is something that kind of happens all over the computational universe and for that matter, all over nature and the natural world. I think it's really ultimately the secret that lets nature make all the complicated stuff that, that we end up seeing in the world. But something else too, it's also sort of a window into what raw, unfettered computation is like. Well, at least traditionally when we do engineering, we're always sort of building things that are simple enough that we can foresee what they'll do. But if we just sort of go out into the computational universe, things can be much wilder. 
I mean, my company happens to have done a lot of mining out there in the computational universe, sort of finding programs that are useful for different purposes. Like, for example, this Rule 30 is really useful for making randomness. And modern machine learning, in some sense, can be thought of as sort of part way from traditional engineering to this kind of uh, free range mining of what's out there in the computational universe. Okay, so, but what can one say in general about the computational universe? Well, one thing one can say is all these programs out there can be thought of as doing computations. And, uh, well, years ago I came up with this thing that I call the principle of computational equivalence that says that if the behavior of something isn't obviously simple, it typically corresponds to a computation that's maximally sophisticated. So there are lots of predictions and implications of this principle, like that, for example, universal computation should be ubiquitous out in the computational universe, and as should undecidability. And it also implies uh, uh, a phenomenon that I call computational irreducibility. So if you look at a sort of typical complicated um, uh, case of this is a very simple program, this is what it does, can you predict what it's going to do? You know, are these little streamers going to go on forever? Is it eventually going to die out? What, what's going to happen? Well, this is an example of a phenomenon that is probably computationally irreducible, which means you, you can't figure out what it's going to do without effectively tracing each step and going through sort of the same computational effort to work out what's going to happen as the system goes through itself to work out what it's going to do. So it's a completely deterministic system, but to us, it's got what seems a bit like free will because we can never know what it's going to do. So here's another thing. We think about, in this kind of context, about what intelligence is. Well, our sort of big unifying principle, this principle of computational equivalence, um, says that everything from sort of a tiny program to our brains should be computationally equivalent, which means that there can't be, there's sort of no bright line between intelligence and mere computation. I mean, when we say something like the weather has a mind of its own, uh, that has some truth to it. It's, it's doing computations that are just, sophistic, just as sophisticated as the computations that are going on in our brains. Well, to us, though, it's pretty alien computation because it, it's not connected. What the weather is doing isn't connected to our, its form of computation or intelligence isn't connected to our human goals and experiences. It's just a sort of raw computation that happens to be going on. So the question then is, so how do we, how do we tame computation? We, we have all this, all this stuff that can happen out there in the computational universe. How do we mold it to our goals? Well, the first step is to describe our goals. And actually, for the past 30 years or so, what I've basically been doing is trying to create a way to do that. I've been building a, a language that's this now called Wolfram Language that... Um, there's its homepage, um, that uh, allows us to kind of express what we want to do. It's a computer language. It's not really like other, any other computer language because it's, in a sense, much crazier. Instead of sort of just telling a computer what to do in its terms, the language tries to build in as much knowledge as possible about computation about the world right into the language so that essentially we humans can describe in our terms what we want to do and then it's up to the language to get those things done as, as automatically as possible. Well, that basic idea has worked really well and in the form of Mathematica, it's been used to make endless inventions and discoveries and things over the years. It's also what's inside Wolfram Alpha, uh, where the idea is to take pure natural language questions and understand them and use the kind of curated knowledge and algorithms um, that our civilization has, has produced to be able to compute answers to these questions. And yes, that's a sort of very classic AI-ish thing. And uh, in practice, it's, of course, computed answers to billions and billions of questions from, from humans, for example, in Siri and, and other places. So I actually had an, an interesting experience recently I, uh, figuring out how to use what we've built in our Wolfram language to teach computational thinking to human kids. Um, and I was writing a book about this, and I was writing exercises for the book. And at the beginning, it was really easy to write these exercises. The basic form of an exercise was make a program to do X. And it was pretty easy to say what X was in kind of English. But later on, it was uh, much more frustrating because it was like, I know exactly what I'm trying to get people to do. I can express it very easily in the Wolfram language, but it's really hard to express what I want done in English. 
and I realized, gosh, this is why I just spent 30 years developing a, a, a language to express things. Well, so English has about 25,000 common words. The, the Wolfram language has about 5,000 kind of carefully designed built-in constructs including all the latest machine learning stuff and so on, together with, together with millions of things based on sort of curated data. Um, and the idea is that uh, once one can, the, the sort of concept, the goal is, once one can think about something in the world computationally, it should be as easy as possible to express that thing in the Wolfram language. Cool thing is, it seems to really work. I mean, humans, including kids, can write and read the language, and so can can computers. It's kind of a high-level bridge between human thinking and its whole sort of cultural context and computation. Okay, so what about AI? Well, technology has sort of always been about finding things that exist in the world and then kind of taming them to automate achieving some particular human goals. And in AI, the things we're taming are things that sort of exist in this computational universe of possible programs. Well, there's a lot of kind of raw computation kind of seething around in that, in that computational universe of, of possibilities, just as there's a lot of complicated computation that we don't necessarily understand that's going on in nature. Um, but what we're interested in is computation that somehow relates to our human goals. Okay, so we want to talk about ethics. So maybe we, we, the, the way to think about that is we want to constrain this computation, this, this AI process, to only do things that we, let's say, consider ethical. But somehow we have to find a way to describe what we mean by that. Well, in the human world, one way we have to do that, at least partially, is with laws. So one question is, how do we connect human laws to computations? Uh, we, we call them legal codes sometimes, but, but today laws and contracts and things like that are basically written mostly in natural language. I mean, there have been simple sort of computable contracts in areas like financial derivatives for a long time, and now one talks about smart contracts in the context of cryptocurrencies and things like that. But what about sort of the vast mass of law that exists out there? Well, I mean, Leibniz, for example, who who died 300 years ago next month, actually, was always talking about making kind of a universal language um, to, as we would say now, express all of law in a kind of computable way. Well, he was a few centuries too early, but I think now we're actually finally in a position to really do this. I mean, I just uh, actually posted a, a blog a, a couple of days ago about this, but I'll, I'll try to, this is a long, long blog, but I'll try to summarize some of the things that, that I talked about there. Um, so, I mean, with what we've already done with the Wolfram language, we, we've been able to, we managed to express a lot of kinds of things in the world, um, like the kinds of things that people, you know, ask Siri about or something like that. And I think we're now within sight of what Leibniz wanted, which is to have a general sort of symbolic discourse language that represents everything that's involved in human affairs. So, I, I see the basic issue of building this as a language design problem, I mean, yes, we can, we can look at natural language to get clues, but ultimately we have to build sort of our own symbolic language to, if we want to be able to create sort of this computable system. It's actually basically the same kind of thing that I've done for, for ages and ages in, in designing the Wolfram language. I mean, take even a, a word like plus. Well, in the Wolfram language, there's a function called plus, but it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as the word. It's a very specific version of meaning that has to do with adding things mathematically and so on. Well, as we design a symbolic discourse language, it's going to be the same kind of thing. I mean, we can take, you know, the word eat in English, for example, can mean lots of things. But we need a concept that we'll probably refer to as eat that's a very specific version that we can then compute with. So let's say we've got a, a contract that's written in natural language. Uh, well, one way to get a, a sort of symbolic version of it is to use some kind of natural language understanding system, just like we do for all those Wolfram Alpha inputs. And sometimes we have to ask humans about ambiguities, you know, which Springfield did you mean, and, and so on. Well, another thing we might do uh, to get um, from our sort of uh, 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 original representation to the symbolic representation, we might have a picture, and we might uh, use machine learning to, to uh, generate a description of that picture in, this, in the form of this precise symbolic language. But ultimately, the best way to actually know what you're trying to write is to write in this symbolic language in the first place, 
And I, actually, I'm kind of guessing that the, the lawyers of the future will spend a lot of their time writing in some kind of symbolic discourse language mechanism. Well, OK, so once you have a contract in sort of symbolic form, you can start to compute about it. You can automatically see if it's satisfied in a particular set of situations. You can simulate different outcomes. You can automatically aggregate together bundles of huge numbers of these contracts and, and, and figure out statistically what's going to happen and build all kinds of funky financial instruments out of them and so on. Well, ultimately, though, the, a contract has to get input from the real world. Some of that input will be born digital, like data about accessing a computer system or transferring Bitcoin or something. Often, though, that input will have to come from sensors and measurements and so on from the real world, and it will take basically machine learning kinds of, of, of methods to turn those, those, those measurements into something symbolic. We'll have to, that, that's sort of where the, those judgments come in. Well, if we can sort of express laws in, in computable form, maybe we can start sort of telling AIs how we want them to act. Um, it might be better if we could sort of boil everything down to, you know, uh, Asimov's laws of robotics or, you know, the, the idea of utilitarianism or, or, or some such other, other thing. But I don't think anything like that is going to work. Um, I think what we're ultimately trying to do is, is to sort of find perfect constraints on computation. But computation is, in, is something that's, in a sense, infinitely wild. So let me, let me give you a, an example of what I mean by this. I mean, the issue already shows up in, for example, Gödel's theorem. Like, let's say we're trying to look at integers, and we're trying to set up axioms that constrain us to be just talking about the everyday integers that we thought we were talking about. Well, one of the things that Gödel's theorem shows is that there is no finite set of axioms that you can construct that constrain things so that you guarantee to be just talking about ordinary integers. There'll always be some wild form of thing that isn't what we'd ordinarily think of an as an integer that is still consistent with those constraints, those axioms that you've set up. Well, actually, this phenomenon of computational irreducibility that I mentioned implies a much more general version of this. Basically, given any uh, set of, of laws or constraints, there'll always be, in a sense, unintended consequences. This isn't, it's not particularly surprising if one looks at kind of the evolution of human law that something like this would be true, but the point is that there's sort of theoretically no way around it. It's a, it's a feature of sort of just what happens in the computational universe. It's, it's ubiquitous in the computational universe. Now, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, AI is going to get more and more important in the world and, and sort of eventually going to control much of the infrastructure of, of human affairs, kind of a bit like governments do now. And like with governments, perhaps the thing we'd like to be able to do is to sort of create an AI constitution that defines what the AIs should be doing. So the question is, what should this constitution be like? Well, it's got to be based on a model of the world and inevitably a sort of imperfect model. And, and then it's got to say sort of what to do in lots of different circumstances. And ultimately, what it's, what it's got to do is provide a way of constraining the computations that happen to be the ones that align with our goals. But, okay, so what should those goals be? Well, I don't think there's any right answer to that. In fact, one can sort of enumerate goals just like one can enumerate kind of programs in the computational universe, and there's no abstract way to choose between, you know, this goal is better than that goal and so on. But for us, there's a way to choose because we have a particular biology and we have a particular history of our culture and our civilization and so on. It's taken sort of a lot of irreducible computation to get here, but now that, 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 uh, that now that we're just at this particular point in the computational universe, that, that corresponds to the goals that, that, that we have. So, you know, human goals have clearly evolved a lot through the course of history, and I suspect they're about to evolve a lot more. Um, I think it's sort of pretty inevitable that, that our sort of consciousness will increasingly merge with technology, and eventually, you know, the, the uh, certain scenario is that you know, our whole civilization will end up as something like a, a box of a trillion kind of uploaded human souls. But then the big question is, okay, well, what will these uploaded human souls choose to do? Well, the bad thing is probably we don't even have a language yet to describe the answer to that. I mean, if we, if we look back even to Leibniz's time, we can see all sorts of modern concepts that hadn't formed yet. And when we look inside, for example, a modern machine learning system, it's, um, or, or for that matter, a theorem-proving system, it's very humbling to sort of see how many concepts 
those systems have effectively created that we haven't yet absorbed in our culture and for which we don't have any words or other ways to describe them. So maybe looked at from uh, our current point of view, it'll seem like those kind of disembodied virtual souls are just sort of playing video games for the rest of eternity. Um, and uh, you know, at first maybe they'll operate in sort of a simulation of our actual universe, then maybe they'll do something that I've enjoyed doing, which is to go out and start exploring the computational universe of all possible universes. But at some level, uh, all they'll be doing is, is computation, and the principle of computational equivalence says it's computation that's fundamentally equivalent to all other computation. It's, it's kind of a bit of a letdown. I mean, you know, the, the proud future of this whole civilization that we've, we've built ends up sort of being just computationally equivalent to, you know, plain physics or little rule 30 or something like that. Of course, in a sense, that type of conclusion is just an extension of kind of the long story of how science keeps on showing us that we are somehow not fundamentally special. Um, we, can't, um, uh, we can't sort of, and, and, and that, in a sense, we, we can't look for sort of ultimate meaning in where we've reached um, in, uh, uh, through the, sort of the, the processes of history that we've gone through. We, we can't define a kind of ultimate purpose or, or for that matter, an ultimate ethics. And in a sense, we sort of have to embrace the details of our, our existence and our, our history. So I think my, my conclusion is that there won't be sort of a simple principle that encapsulates what we want in our kind of AI constitution. There'll be lots of details that reflect the details of our existence and our history. I mean, the first step is just to sort of understand how to represent these things. Um, which is what I think we can now start to, to look at doing with something like a symbolic discourse language. And yes, conveniently, I happen to have just spent 30 years building the framework to create such a thing. Um, and I'm keen to understand how can, we, can, um, uh, we can actually use that to, to start creating things like a, an AI constitution. Well, I thought I, I, I better stop talking about philosophy here. Usually I spend my time building technology, but I, I'll stop here and I hope there are questions and comments and things. Thanks. Hello, uh, Peter, Voss, Peter Voss here. I'd be curious to know what your best guess is as to when we'll reach human level intelligence and AI. So. When will we reach human level intelligence? You know, I've, I've been working on AI kinds of things for probably 35 years, and people keep on saying, whenever, when the system is able to do X, then we'll be really impressed. And you know, I've done quite a few of those Xs through technology that I've built, and it's kind of disappointing because people aren't that impressed. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I, I think the, the main point is that the disembodied intelligence is something that we reached long ago Disembodied intelligence is just computation. The issue is, is it intelligence that we recognize as being human-like intelligence? And that's really a question of exactly how we kind of, uh, how we imprint kind of human-like things on this computation that we in a sense already have. So I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's really, it's very much in the eye of the beholder. And I think the questions about how human-like the experiences and, uh, uh, and operations of the thing have to be in order that we recognize it as human intelligence. There's, there's really a very close analogy between extraterrestrial intelligence and artificial intelligence. You know, we see some, it's like, okay, how should the stars be arranged so that we know that something intelligent arranged those stars? Well, there are many ways stars would arrange themselves with gravity or whatever else. Uh, there may be some incredibly intelligent arrangement of stars out there, but it doesn't relate to our human notions of intelligence. And so we don't, we don't recognize it as such. And I think it's the same type of thing with, with AI. So I think, it's a, I think it's a deeply slippery issue. Hi, my name is Chris Howder. I'm an alumnus of Columbia University. Uh, the question is about the Wolfram language. Um, so putting on the, or ask, asking the language designer uh, implementer part of you. Um, what were the difficult, uh, sorry, this question is about the symbolic discourse language, the new uh -huh. language you're creating. Based on your experience over the last thir three, 30 years building the Wolfram language, what are the difficulties, whether implementation or theoretical, uh, scaling difficulties, parser, lexer, AST, interpreter, etc., that you foresee will be problematic in the development of the symbolic discourse language? And finally, this is an open-ended question, so answer it as you will. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, so I mean, the thing that's, language design is really hard. I mean, I've, I've worked on a bunch of different things that people think are hard, like physics and math and other such things. Language design is really hard compared to those things, because it's really, it pushes you right into having to really understand things with maximum possible clarity. I mean, what you're trying to do when you design a language, you're, you're trying to design a framework for people to think in. I suppose a little bit like philosophy has tried to do, but in, as a language designer, you don't get to just write essays about these things. You actually have to implement stuff, and then you have to stick with what you implemented. Um, the, uh, uh, so it's really you know, drilling down. I, I view the role of a language designer more or less as this. When you're thinking about computation, you're imagining all the possible kinds of computations people might want to do, and then you're working a bit like a natural scientist. You're kind of drilling down underneath what you see people want to do to find what primitives exist that you can then build up from to let people conveniently create what they want to do. Well, I think the symbolic discourse language, it's the same kind of thing. We have to look at sort of everything that's out there in sort of the world of human affairs and so on, and we have to say, what are the fundamental concepts? How should we best slice things up? And, you know, people like in the 1600s, it was quite a popular thing to do, to invent philosophical languages. Um, there's a chap called John Wilkins who had a, a fine, one of the better developed philosophical languages, um, which was an attempt to kind of uh, uh, do this, this sort of thing of slicing up concepts in the world in some, in some way. Well, the hard thing, I think, is, is, is actually doing that. And it's something where, in a sense, to do it, you have to take a flying leap and just start doing it. Because there isn't really, it's not like there's a, there's a big framework that already exists. It's just you've got to start deciding how it's going to work. As, as people have done, you know, when, when it's Roger making up his thesaurus or something like this. Um, but that, I think that's the main, the main difficulty is, is just that you have to understand things clearly and, and be able to drill down there. I think we have a question over there. Yes. And there's one here and then here. Hi. Um, over here. I'm just curious, uh, do you think we live in a deterministic universe? And uh, tangentially, what are your thoughts on this question of uh, whether our present reality is a simulation or not? So I've, I've worked quite a bit on fundamental physics. I kind of, the tantalizing thing is when you see these simple programs like the cellular automata that I showed, and you see how tiny their rules are, and you see how complicated what they do is, you start thinking, well, gosh, maybe our whole universe is like that. Maybe there's really some simple rule underneath our whole universe. If we think about you know, our universe being determined by a program, we might, you know, the program might be the size of an operating system, you know, millions of lines of code. Seems implausible. More likely, it's something short. That's a weird claim in itself because it's kind of very anti-Copernican. You know, Copernicus kind of has sort of taught us that we shouldn't think of ourselves as special in some way. So why should we get the universe that's the special one that has a simple program? In terms of kind of thinking about simulation, you know, is our universe as it is now existing a simulation? I think that argument is a muddle, okay? Because the way I see it, uh, you know, this question, okay, you asked about determinism. My, when you say something is non-deterministic, what you're saying is, I don't know everything about how the system works. There's something outside the system that is randomly kicking the system. There's a part that I know that's deterministic, and then there's the non-deterministic part that's kicking it. That's kind of a wimp out when you're trying to make a theory in science. Um, and so, you know, the question is, can, you know, the first cut is, let's just say maybe our universe is deterministic. Maybe there's just a rule, an initial condition. Maybe everything that happens, the question you ask, the answer I'm giving, is all ultimately determined by, by those things. Um, I think that's a, a good first hypothesis. I don't know any way to prove that isn't true, so that's a hypothesis that I'm working on. In terms of, of uh, if you, I, I think it is quite plausible that there is just a simple deterministic rule that determines what, how the universe works. It's kind of like the digits of pi. Um, there's a simple deterministic rule that determines them, and then you generate all those digits, and it's like you generate our whole universe, and, and here's everything that happens, just like we see all the digits of pi. Now, you say, well, what would it mean if there's a simulation going on there? You know, underneath, there's a down at the Planck scale, there's this whole civilization that's uh, r arranging things very carefully to make our world be the way it is. But actually, they're stuck in the same deterministic system too. So the question of whether there is something down at the Planck scale that's a whole civilization comes exactly back to the previous question that was asked about intelligence, actually. It's a question of how do we tell, you know, it's like we're searching for extraterrestrial intelligence it's not extraterrestrial, it's everywhere inside our universe, but we're searching down there and we're saying, is it intelligence, is it a civilization, or is it just physics, so to speak?
Hi, uh, my name is Jim. Uh, I didn't major in uh, philosophy either, but since we're on that kind of spirit, I have a philosophical question as well. Um, so it's, it's in the same similar spirit as the previous question. Uh, so if you think the universe is uh, computational in, in some nature, uh, how do you, um, well, what's your best hypothesis on how consciousness uh, arises out of this fundamentally computational universe? And on that topic, I guess, uh, whether you think free will exists in the whole related philosophical conundrum. Whether we, whether we really exist, you're asking? No, no, whether free will exists and oh, how consciousness arises from computation. Okay. So, uh, I think so the word my, was brought up. I mean, the first statement about free will is that I'm, I'm really pretty... I'm, I'm really pretty sure that the way we, uh, you know, free will and determinism, uh, you know, work together is through this idea of computational irreducibility. That even though there is determinism, you can't know what's going to happen any, any sort of faster, more easily than the system itself. So the system itself is, it, it's like deciding what to do, and we're trying to say, no, 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 I know what you're going to do. You don't have free will. I know what you're going to do. Actually. Um, you know, you can't tell what the system is going to do uh, except by just following through exactly what it does. And you can, you can start tracing through all the sort of implications of free will about responsibility and so on. Is this system responsible for its actions? Well, actually it is. It's more responsible for its actions than if you say, this is a system which is being kicked by the outside world in certain ways, that's being sort of, the environment is forcing it to, to do this or that. Now you ask about consciousness and so on. I, I, I you know, I, I hate this term because I think, you know, if you look at the sort of stack of different things that start from life, go to intelligence, then you get to consciousness and so on, every one of them has the following feature that, you know, let's take life as an example, okay? So how do we define life? You know, what is alive, what is not alive? On Earth, it's pretty easy. There's shared history to everything. Everything that's alive has RNA in it. That's a very specific thing. Um, it's probably not the general abstract notion of life, that life has to have RNA in it. But we don't really have a good abstract definition of life. You know, people have tried different definitions. They never really work. And the reason is, I think, because ultimately the only thing is that there's sort of sophisticated computation going on, but there's nothing that defines life except by this sort of historical definition. I was saying the same thing about intelligence, and I think it's even worse with consciousness. Uh, yeah, I, I have two questions. One is, um, I'm really surprised that you think that free will has something to do with unpredictability, because I think most philosophers wouldn't say that. That uh, They wouldn't deny, first of all, that something or someone was acting freely simply because it was predictable that they would do something. Because, let's say, a completely rational person, you can predict what they'll do, but you wouldn't necessarily, from that, on that basis, deny free will. But the other, the major point I was concerned with is when you talked about any given set of constraints as rules will always lead to unintended consequences. Sometimes philosophers distinguish between a rule and a principle. So that it's something like the difference between the letter and the spirit of the law. So you try to set up a set of rules, okay, and you find yourself when you deal with certain cases, okay, in the law, that the rule leads you to peculiar consequences, all right? There's something wrong, all right? You haven't captured what you had hoped to capture. But you understand that because you understand a principle that lies behind the rule. And I'm wondering if there's anything like that that is computable for AI, namely that they see the peculiarities the rule will generate, but they understand the principle behind it. I mean, a, a simple example was, you know, HLA Hart talked about rules that said cars should not be right, driven in the park, and then somebody has a toy car. Well, there's obviously the intent of the law is, by, is not captured by the rule, and we understand that, and is there something comparable? That's an interesting, okay. Interesting question. So, so I mean, I think, uh, well, first of all, about free will, um, I'm not a professional philosopher. I decided not to do that when I was five years old or something. So I can't, I can't debate all the, all the details of, of, uh, of how philosophers talk about free will, although there's, there's a lot more that I could say than the few sentences that I just said. Um, in terms of, of sort of the intent, the principle, as opposed to the letter of what's going on, in a sense, what I'm what one does when one sets things up computationally, when one talks about symbolic systems and so on, is one's trying to grind out all of those sort of humanistic types of things and sort of desiccate everything to the point where it is just a bunch of symbols and where there is something definite that can be said. Now, if you ask the question, is there, can there be 
more general principles. In other words, you've got some particular set of rules, let's say, is there a more general principle at work? Let me give you an analogy, okay? In mathematics. So in mathematics, there is, uh, in a sense, there's a, we can prove that there's sort of an infinite frontier to mathematics. You will, you will prove certain theorems, but there'll always be more theorems to prove. There'll always be more, in a sense, principles to discover. You'll never reach the edge of, of the principles that there are to discover. In fact, it's sort of a consequence of this computational irreducibility idea that there will always be, that there'll always be more to discover. So, so I'll give you an example. Let's say we're, we're looking in, at physics at the universe. What can we build in the universe? Can we build a spaceship with warp drive, something like this? It, we may be able to just straight answer that question, but there's no guarantee it's kind of an undecidability type thing. There's no guarantee that given the building blocks that we have in the universe, there may be no sort of finite way to decide whether we can build a spaceship that will support warp drive. And it's the same type of thing, I think, with this, this question about, I mean, you're asking about, you know, can there be a deeper principle? Can one discover a deeper principle? I think a consequence of this principle of, computa the, of, um, the, of, principle of computational equivalence and computational irreducibility, I think a consequence is there will always be deeper principles. Can one get to the point where, where one, wh wh there will never be a, 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 an ultimate principle or a, or a lowest principle, but there will always be more that can be discovered, like in mathematics. It, you won't reach the edge where you just say, now we understand everything. We've got the complete set of rules where we've got everything nailed down. There'll always be more that can be discovered. Um, it's an interesting question, and there's probably, probably more that I'm, that I'm not. Uh, just one more comment about this, okay? The, the, um, the, the thing that happens, um, for example, when you look at the output from an automated theorem proving system. Um, you can establish that something is true, but what you see is a bunch of little sort of atoms of, of fact there. Um, it is not something that humans can relate to because there are no sort of waypoints that are, you know, Smith's theorem, Jones's theorem, that everybody knows what they are. They're no kind of, they're no kind of things, concepts that have emerged that we understand. And I think when you talk about principles, I think in part what you're maybe talking about is these kinds of things that have emerged as culturally known things to us that, um, and, I, and I think one of the things that happens in this sort of computational world is that you get all these little bits of computation and the question of whether we can understand parts of that in some, in some way where we can talk about them is a, is a different and sort of more, it's, it's, it's more a question about human history than it is about the raw computation. Okay, thanks. Nice. I know I miss some people, but there'll be a panel uh, uh, at the end, so you can ask your question then. Um, so, thank you. So next off, we have uh, Professor Francesca Rossi. Uh, she uh, teaches at University of Padova and is a computer scientist. Uh, she's the president of the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence and is associate editor-in-chief 